Hi guys. No doing? Scott yet, huh? Not yet. Oh, not yet. Uh, okay, and I see Enid. Can you guys hear me? Give me a wave. Talk to me, Enid. Can you hear me? Yeah, all right. Yes, we can. I haven't oh, got my okay. textbook yet. You still haven't gotten your textbook? Anybody no, I haven't. Okay, I just asked the secretary. Um, before class this evening, about four o'clock, uh -huh. she said everyone yeah, I'd like except to tell one you. should have theirs because none of them have come back or anything, and they mailed them all out. So, Mr. did C you call, Larry? Did you call the office and ask if they had mailed yours? I haven't called. Try talking to me again, Larry. I haven't called yet. Okay. I did not ask about yours specifically. Uh, okay, but you have one there with Clay that you can um, that you can share tonight, don't you? Yes, sir. Yes, we do. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Okay, I see. I see Sandra there. Good evening, Sandra. Can you hear me? Try speaking into your microphone and let's see if it'll pick you up tonight. Well, I can't hear Sandra. Okay, it looks like Frederick there. Give your sound system a try, Frederick. See if I can hear you. Tell me how well I'm coming in there. Dr. Swigger? This is Hello? this is Carlos over in Okmogi. Uh, yes, I I just wanted to let you know I have not received a textbook either and, and uh, I failed to call this morning about it, but uh, I uh, I still haven't received it. There there may be it, it seems like there's a pattern here. You two guys, Larry and Carlos, are enrolled on campus and I bet when she printed out her extension roster. Yes. It did not have your names on it. Neither would it have Wade Friesen's name. So they probably sent everyone out that were that was on the extension okay. roster and forgot the three of you guys that were enrolled on campus. Okay. That's a good possibility. Okay. Uh, and I am going to be on the road for the next two days, actually three days. So I will not have an opportunity till late Thursday afternoon uh, to check up for you. So I would highly recommend that you call Gail or Patty okay. at the extension office at OSU. Okay. Okay. Gail or Patty? It'd be a good idea to do that early on tomorrow because we have a mail out going to you anyway. Okay. Okay. All right. supposed to go out tomorrow and that way she can put them both together if it has not gone out for some reason okay all right all right thank you all right thank you and i guess you can share with willie yeah. and scott if he shows up tonight carlos okay we'll do that all right 
I do not yet see uh, Woodward. Woodward, if you can hear me, uh, please speak into your microphones. Let's see if uh, your video will come up. It. I think I see Wade. Are, are you there at Tulsa, Wade? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, you're in Tulsa. Is uh, Larry Gregory or uh, Bill Vallant with you? Anyone else there with you? In Tulsa. Ah, oh, there's Shawnee. Finally. Let's see Jody. Wade, is there anyone else with you there in Tulsa? Okay. Once again. Anyone happens to miss what's going on? This is being recorded, and the uh, tape is available. Okay. I'm gonna quit messing with this thing, and we're just gonna get on with it. I see Don again. Okay, we're just gonna go ahead and, and get on with the program tonight. Uh, we'll get finished probably a little sooner than 10 o'clock as usual. But first of all, Just kiss the clothes of the football guy. <laughs> Did you know who won at the end of it? Last week, I think I got there about the middle of the third quarter. I got to watch Bill, the rest of the third have you quarter. Yeah, so it wasn't too bad. Ah, <laughs> I just saw McAllister, I think. Go ahead and speak into your microphone again. Okay, we've got it teed up now. Just wondered if you're getting us down here. Okay, yes, I can hear you and I can see you. Hi, coming in all right? Great. All right, wonderful. Thanks, guys. Okay, um, let's do a little bit of review first uh, from last week. Remember, we talked about uh, philosophy for the most part. Philosophy then is the systems of belief or system of belief that an individual or society has that governs their daily action. It becomes those beliefs by which you base all of your decisions on what you do and how you govern your life. That's really uh, the basic what philosophy, philosophy basically is, okay? And we can work from there with more specific um, and fancier definitions, but for me, that really works. It also establishes an individual's place in the overall scheme of things. That is, everyone Everyone needs to know how they fit um, in, in life, you know, in their society, in their nation, in their world, even more basically, their community, their school, their family. It gives a person a frame of reference, okay? Do you feel like you're a rather large duck in a small puddle? Or do you feel like you're just a, a fly speck on a great big uh, panoramic window of the world? Who knows, you know? It kind of depends on your philosophy, all right? How you view yourself. Philosophy also answers some questions for us besides just giving us a place in, in the overall all scheme of things. It answers what is true, what is real, and what is of value. Amber was talking about that last week. So, really, 
many of the things that you would think about in relation to uh, your place in the world or how you think of education, what you think of politics, a lot of those kinds of questions that govern your daily life, really those questions can be boiled down to those three things. What do you believe is real about that? What do you believe is true about that situation or issue? And what do you really think is valuable? We talked about that before as a teacher. Do you look at your job as a teacher and find the reality of teaching being in the classroom, facing the student, and trying to teach them a skill. Is that your reality? Do you feel like that the truths of teaching are that you are really teaching them something that they cannot get anywhere else? Do you really think it's true that every student can learn? Do you really think it's true that every student is valuable? Do you really think it's true that you are making a contribution to society by teaching these students and they thereby uh, are possibly going to contribute positively to society. Is that true to you? Do you think that what you do is valuable? Do you think the contribution that you're making to the student's life and to society, do you think that's really a positive thing? Do you think it's really valuable? Or do you seek value in your paycheck? Maybe both. Maybe a little bit of both. Maybe they're fairly evenly balanced, or maybe the paycheck is really the kind of secondary thing because we, after all, have to pay the bills and eat and survive. But your real mission in life and your real value as a teacher, you see, is, con is contributing to the welfare of your students and progress in society. Maybe that is. Maybe that's what it is, okay? All right. We also talked about uh, the prevailing philosophy in education being the liberal philosophy. Remember what the liberal was? Liberal philosophy was the study of the classics. Um, it's learning for learning's sake. It's disciplining the mind so that the harder the education, the harder the curriculum, the more difficult the literature. Uh, let's even put it, your studies in a different language. Let's do it in Latin or Greek or whatever. The more difficult it is, the better it disciplines the mind and better your education is. Huh. And you see that prevalent, we talked about, clear back from, you remember the Oriental education in early, early times before the Greek and Roman civilization in China? So what was the main thing with that education? It was highly revered, was it not? but it did not prepare the individual to make his own way in society. Those people became highly revered teachers, but they had to live on a meager salary and at the subsistence of the society or their community or their students. Okay? You find that true to a certain extent even today. You find a real difference between the one hand the Ivy League type schools that you can find much of these same things prevalent. Learning for learning's sake, discipline in the mind, emphasizing the classics, literature, art, music, etc. And so when a person comes out of that kind of university with their degree, they have a lot of this kind of stuff, but not a whole lot of the specifics that enable them to contribute to society as far as maintaining themselves, 
uh, or uh, even a profession, unless, of course, that profession is to turn right around and teach that same literature or music or art or whatever. Okay. Vocational education, on the other hand, develops his philosophical roots in pragmatism and the writings, not writings, Oh boy, I didn't preview this slide very well, did I? In the education writings of William James, John Dewey converted the pragmatism of James into educational progressivism. And I shared with you last week that uh, philosophically, you will find me a pretty straightforward progressive. So, uh, I identify very strongly with John Dewey. I'm probably going to do you a favor in that we're not going to read much of Dewey. If any of you have, uh, up to this point, read much of John Dewey, you'll find that his writing is really pretty difficult to follow, pretty difficult to wade through. Once you do, though, you find a really great consistency over all of his writing, and he wrote a lot about vocational education, a lot about general public education. He wrote about ethics and virtue and all sorts of things, Phil, uh, general philosophy. But you'll find a really uh, wonderful sense of cohesiveness in his ideas. You'll find that really he, he makes a lot of good sense on a really basic level. And uh, it's kind of hard to get there sometimes. But we'll probably identify some throughout the uh, semester that relates back to John Dewey. Okay? If you were to read much of him and study much about him, you would see a lot of his ideas prevalent in your school, and your curriculum probably, certainly in this state. Okay. We also talked about becoming familiar with the philosophy of vocational trade and industrial education in Oklahoma. And you remember then we talked about also the 10 basic assumptions. Uh, if you look in your book, back on
uh, taking your programs in kind of aimless directions. Okay. Tonight, well, if no one, does anyone have any questions that they, they would like uh, to ask at this point? About the review or what we've talked about so far. Tonight we're going to go on and talk about the development of public vocational education. And as you are supposed to have read in your book, beginning on about page 47, you see it began with apprenticeships. Apprenticeships were really, really popular uh, hundreds of years ago. We've talked about that somewhat already. And the guilds and in the indentured servant, uh, the indentured student, uh, were all kinds of forms of apprenticeships. And that's basically how all the artisans and craftsmen learned their trades was through an, apprenticeship, uh, through an apprenticeship of some sort. But we saw something develop for the first time in the world in the 1800s, late 1700s, when the Industrial Revolution began to gain momentum. We found that apprenticeships were not really fast enough. They didn't turn out enough craftsmen. They didn't turn out enough workers for the growing numbers of factories and that sort of thing. That small guild that was so picky about who they brought in and that master craftsman who could only uh, manage one or two or three or maybe a half a dozen students uh, or apprentices at a time found that they fell behind rather quickly. So industry itself and the educational system began to react to this need. You will find also, many of you, that there is now a resurgence of apprenticeships. <coughs> that modern apprenticeships now take on some different kinds of things. The apprenticeships of old many times required that the apprentice live with the master. And their service took on not only just uh, working during the day and watching uh, the master and gradually picking up uh, the craft or the art or whatever, but it was kind of a lifestyle. Uh, it, it pretty well consumed their time. The indentured servants were the same way. They signed on for a certain number of years and much of the time uh, their time belonged to that master. And so the master's trade and his livelihood then came from a lot from the work of the apprentices and, and himself. Modern apprenticeships are not quite like that. It, it looks more like a school in effect, a formal training program, a formal agreement that you make with, again, uh, maybe a master or a mentor or a journeyman, craftsman, technician, and you agree to work at a certain wage for a certain length of time. At the end of that time, if you master that trade, then you receive your journeyman's license or you receive uh, whatever recognition or certification that you are looking for. Most of the time, uh, much of the time, also uh, permanent employment or full-time employment at the journeyman level or the master level is also available. So these, these type of arrangements are not just for training purposes like a school, but it's to train employees for that particular business. Uh, it has been the complaint, I'm sure most of you have heard it, one form or another, one time or another, 
that education has failed in the United States. They do not prepare workers that industry needs. So industry has taken it upon itself in many, many different forms of the training of their employees, and they would rather have the their entry-level employees that are very uh, good at thinking skills, problem solving, communications, math, that sort of thing that would be appropriate to that trade. But then that industry will train the individual specifically in the specific technical skills that they need for that particular particular industry or that particular plant or that particular organization. And each organization has a different organizational philosophy and structure. They may have different kinds of machines. And uh, so there are a lot of specific things that you can't train a student for in a school that the industry does their specific training. So there is some resurgence in that already. All right. Early on, uh, in public schools, much of the what we would call vocational or the precursor to vocational education was really just shop work instruction. And the only real purposes were one for physical exercise because it was deemed necessary and profitable that a person have good physical exercise to help stay in shape and stay healthy. But those schools also used the work of the students to help dis defray cost of the school and the cost of that education. Yes. Okay, this is Tulsa. We want to know, could you hear us? Uh, this is Tulsa, yeah. Okay, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. I can't understand you very well. Okay. Okay. But these early shop work, this early shop work, really didn't have anything to do with teaching the students a vocation. It was not, it was not to prepare that student to go out into the world and, and work. It was just for uh, helping the school to freight costs and for some physical exercise. Then you see the advent of Mechanics Institute this was more like extension training, okay, for maybe an industry or a, or a factory or whatever would have some sort of extension training and it was specific then to that industry. Some of the early technical schools then that came uh, into being did start to meet the training needs of a student and prepared them to go to work. All right. Now the, the manual training that uh, thrives by 1900 in the secondary schools uh, survived and maybe some of you uh, experienced it. I know when I was in high school in the 60s that we still had a manual training high school in Muskogee, Oklahoma. And uh, I had known about it for a long time and it survived for uh, some very few years after I graduated in 67. But by about 1970 and the early 70s in Oklahoma, almost all of the manual training high schools disappeared. One of two things usually happened. That high school simply was closed, or it became a comprehensive high school, or was converted at least into more of a comprehensive high school. What 
what happened in Oklahoma about 1970 to about 1975. Think about it for a minute. That might have caused the manual training high schools to disappear. That was when the area of vocational technical schools came into being. And many of them were online then, about 1975. Some a little bit earlier, some a little bit later. So then we found the area Votech school taking the place of the manual training high school. Now these academic schools, the manual training high schools, again, training for employment was not one of the values that the school boards or the principals or the superintendents published as being a real purpose of that academic high school. Again, the training of, that they had in craft or artwork or whatever trade was simply, again, for exercise, manual dexterity, learning to apply some of the concepts of math or whatever that they learn, or just something interesting to do, okay, really. Even most recently, it's still viewed as a basis for further instruction and training. That is, if, if you had training in those crafts or those trade areas, in the, that type of setting, all it was was just exploratory or introductory. And if you really were serious about that trade, you had to go seek serious training for that trade elsewhere. Then private trade schools begin to spring up all over the nation. Toward the latter 19th century, these private trade schools, uh, many of them uh, funded by industry, are funded by people who saw a need that industry had and uh, saw that as people began to flock from the country to the cities and to urban areas, that those people would pay and could pay for training. And so these private trade schools began to spring up. But unlike many of the trade schools that we saw spring up back in the 16, 15, 16, 1700s, they were just to get paupers off the street to help uh, the city state to do some of the mundane chores or just something for to keep the incorrigibles off of the streets. These trade schools were not that way. They were for people that really needed training for work, were able-bodied, and were looking for specific job training. This really helped prove that trade training could be effectively done in special schools. That is, schools that were for trade training by itself and not some manual training kind of something stuck onto the regular public school of the time. Okay? And that really was what began to set the pattern for public vocational schools. Okay, we now come to, uh, we have a rationale, we have a need, we have uh, the proven fact in the private trade schools that, hey, it really works, it can be done, and so as a national trend, the uh, Congress, maybe the senators and representatives, much of industry and educators begin to say, hey, we need to take another look at education in America. So in 1905, Massachusetts 
appointed a commission known as the Douglas Commission, and uh, they gave their recommendations back to the state in 1906. And the recommendations were that you need to modify school courses, first of all, in your regular public academic school. You need to create a commission on industrial education and a system of independent schools for industrial education. You also need to be sure that as you're creating all these new schools and all this new coursework and that sort of thing, that you preserve the integrity of the academic public school. This was a landmark happening, all right? Many states took the lead, uh, followed that lead, and it be industrial education began to be promoted on a national basis. The National Society for the Promotion of Industrial Education was created right about that time in 1906. The Commission on National Aid to Vocational Education also came into being about that same time. And a little bit later, then, they came, became the National Society for Vocational Education. Some of these societies' goals were, first of all, whatever funding could be generated through the states or through the national government, they were into safeguarding that for vocational education. It was a phenomenon at the time, and it has happened somewhat since then, that funding may have uh, been provided for particular programs, but as those funds were given to the school district to use, they really didn't get used as they were intended. Those funds were just there, they were at the school's disposal, and the school said, hey, you know, we need a new sports stadium, we need a new uh, gym, we need whatever, and sometimes that money was not used for its intended purpose. So the societies were there to help see that a lot of the funds for vocational educa education were safeguarded. They wanted to make sure that state aid remained in local control so that local school boards and local communities could use the funds to help meet their needs. There obviously, uh, some of the urban centers may have different needs than the rural and some that have different kinds of manufacturing concerns. And so if you had just a flat funding set up for the entire state or the entire nation, some people might get their needs met and some may not. So it's a really important principle that uh, local control be maintained. And that this education was open to all citizens free of charge. Look at the area Votech schools right now. They have their own funding that is separate from the regular high schools and regular academic schools, separate from higher ed. The state aid that comes to those schools stays right there at that school and is used with local control, with a local separate school board, and they do provide, again, the high school secondary student with um, education, and free education, just like the regular high school. It was also recommended by these societies that the boards of education for the vocational schools were composed of represent representatives from industry, not educators, not politicians. Much of the time you see local school boards or regular schools 
higher education, regular school systems. A lot of the school board members have their own agenda, don't they? They're not local businessmen. They're not representatives from industry, employees and employers. But they're politicians. Or they're educators. And these societies felt that it was important for vocational education to be a little different. Some of these differences, they, they really uh, nailed down. They felt like that these were factors in the success of the vocational education. First of all, the method of administration had to be different. Teacher qualifications needed to be different. You didn't find teachers that went through high school and then went to college and studied math or whatever, English or history or whatever, and then went straight into the vocational school. They took tradesmen out of industry and made teachers out of them. We'll come back to that point later, and not just this one time, but all through this course. We'll refer back to that from time to time. The course of study would really be different in the vocational school. It'd not be more of the same stuff with just a little bit of more of a technical side to it, but it would be technical with academic support. The facilities and equipment really had to be different. I can remember, here I sound like an old fart, maybe I am, I can remember when I was in junior high school, and in high school before uh, the area of Votech schools, we had industrial arts. I took drafting. I had metal shop and woodworking shop. And one of the things that was really different about the Votech schools that I work with today in our area of vocational system is that the tools and equipment generally were not state of the art or not, did not approach it. They were good for an introduction to that kind of trade or craft. They were basic kinds of tools most of the time, but they were not what you generally found in industry. Most of the projects that we did were you know, food jacks, coat hangers, um, you know, a, a broom holder. We made license plates cast out of aluminum that we could paint on a little bit while we put on the front of our old car that, uh, you know, had various things on them, might say Chevy or Ford. Or not real practical for making a living. It was not training students to eventually, when they left those programs, to go out and get a job using those skills. And the society felt that it was critical for the success of vocational education that the facilities and equipment be industry, um, be, be that that you would find in industry, be approved by industry, okay? They also felt that it was important to be flexible, to be able to meet the student's needs. That's one other thing that you can find that's really, uh, I think one of the, the main features of Oklahoma vocational education is that if a need is expressed in it by industry or by a community, it says we really need training in this area that a Votech school usually can get that together and up and running and find a teacher and get facilities and all online within a year. Here at OSU, if we want to have a new course in trade industrial education, First of all, the faculty gets together and we research it and we put together what we think would be a good curriculum. We write a proposal that goes to the dean. 
and this process goes back and forth for a little while and usually takes the first year. Then the dean submits it after it's approved to the university, the university to the region, and then it has to go through an unbelievable amount of stuff. I mean, the uh, budget people have to look at it and say, okay, how's it going to be funded? Et cetera, et cetera. And by the time a course actually gets approved and named and in the catalog where people can enroll in it, it takes two or three or four years. Changing curriculum in your local high school is just about the same kind of painful process. The school board says, no, we bought those math books. They're supposed to last five years. We're not changing anything until we get our money's worth out of our investment, okay? So that class is stuck with that book for five years. Okay, that's just kind of the way it is. The society then thought that it was really important for the success of vocational education if they were re really flexible and uh, responsive to the needs of the students in the community. All right. Beginning in 1914, then, you see uh, a real concentration of effort that had been going on with these national societies and it began to really come together. There be, it began to really solidify into real proposals and real legislation on the national level. A report by the Commission on the National Aid to Vocational Education had several recommendations. First of all, they said there was a really, there really was a need for vocational education nationwide. There was a need for national grants by the federal excuse me, by the federal government to the states. And then it really should be uh, they identified the kinds of vocational education for which grants should be given. So it's just not People couldn't just say, oh, well, I'm training people for industry or this is vocational education and so, you know, I want some of the money too. No, these were identified and given legitimacy. They also said that there should be aid to vocational education through federal agencies, not just like number two, that there should be aid from the state or national grants to the state but that there should be aid to vocational education directly through federal agencies. You will find now that JTPA, uh, several kinds of nationally, federally funded kinds of things um, are really happening. It also made recommendations for the extent of government aid. Should the government pay 100% of it? Should they just be a token contributor, 5%, 10%, whatever? They made recommendations in that area. You see, this is really forming a, the, the real sound basis for legislation. And they also then established conditions under which all these grants should be con given. That is, what kind of equipment, what kind of facilities do you have? What kind of certification should your teachers have? You know, how many t teachers should there be per student? Or how many students per teacher? Or whatever. And then they pr proposed some legislation. Much of the Congress uh, we're looking toward these national societies for guidance. And so very soon these committees
commission recommendations took form and federal partnerships began to happen. And as the federal government began to get their legislation together, again, you'll remember when we were talking about the basic aims of these commissions before, and a few slides before, it said that the state's rights should be protected, that local control should be retained. Here again, that is one of the main purposes here, that the state's rights be respected in all of this legislation. That the plan that the federal government had for vocational education in a particular state needed to be approved by that state, okay? They asked the state, they asked for a state approval and that the proper expenditures for tools, equipment, facilities, whatever, again, had built-in safeguards. Do these look familiar? Does it look like the, the recommendations and the work of the society are really taking form? And we're talking about over the space of what? About 10 years now, right? Since the, no, a little less than 10 years since the Douglas Commission, since this be so, the society really has a rather large effort and have accomplished a lot in really a short amount of time. Because we've been talking about hundreds of years and really slow changes over the evolution of education, and now within the matter of 10 to 15 years, this is really coming together in America. So they decided that as one of the recommendations that efficiency should be safeguarded. That is, uh, if the states want their money, they're going to have to show that they've used it wisely. They're going to have to have good evaluation systems. And that federal money has to be matched by the state and, and local entities. This is important also because not only does it help give the states and local governments help them retain control, but they also have to take initiative. They have to make effort. They have to work at developing and funding their own programs. What usually does that mean? If, if localities have to, or an individual, have to put in a lot of their own effort, their own money, don't they usually take a little bit more pride in the program? Now those of you who have teenagers are, are going to have kids that are coming up of age that they can earn a little extra money. Or I, I use the example of my kids when it came time for them to get their first car. Dad didn't just go out and buy a car and give it to them and say, here, go to it. I'm paying your insurance. I'll give you gas money. I'll make sure that car is maintained well. Just have fun and take off. No, that's not what I did. Of course, my situation is a little different. I taught auto body. I had a shop. My kids had to build their first car with me. I'll pay for it. I'll provide most of the money for all of the basic stuff on the car. Now, stereo and a lot of fancy stuff like that, if you wanted fancy striping or, you know, some mag wheels or something like that, well, it's kind of on their own in that regard. They could personalize it the way they wanted to or as they could afford. But they had to be there. I said, I'll help you work on it. As long as you need or want help, if you're out there in that shop 
hey, I'll go out and help, but I'm not going to work on it if you're not there. And so by the time that year went by that we built that car before they could drive, or sometimes they didn't work on it quite as hard, and thought it would come together a little quicker and they'd already passed their 16th birthday and they were really anxious for that car. By the time that car was finished, there was a real source of pride in both of my boys. And I feel like that it really made a difference in how well they took care of the vehicle. I didn't get called at 10 o'clock at night after the ball game and said, Daddy, some little thingy it's making some kind of little noise, and it smells bad. I don't know what it is. No. They knew what everything he was on that car because they had already worked on it themselves. They had their own toolbox, and if they couldn't fix it themselves there, they could at least tell me and describe what it was that was going on. And so I felt like it made a real difference. I think it's the same kind of philosophy, it's the same kind of principle that were being applied here to the education system, okay? The federal government didn't just slap their money down and say, okay, here's the program, here's what you're going to do, because we're funding it, and, no, nope. there was a lot of local control and input, and there was a lot of local responsibility for funding as well. So. I think that's one of the keys to success for vocational education. There's one other key that's different. Remember I talked a little while ago about some of the money that really didn't find its way where it was supposed to have gone? Because, yes, the program was funded, and the funds did reach the local level, but those funds were given in anticipation of them being used the way they were supposed to be used. So the commission made uh, a little bit different kind of recommendation to the federal government, and that was for reimbursement. So what happens now is that the guidelines are established, the protocol is established, the curriculum and the administration and all of that sort of thing is already established and is agreed upon. Then, as the local school board or local school district or whatever, the state, as they show that those agreements have been met, and that the monies have been expended in the agreed upon manner that at certain intervals then that money is reimbursed that they have already spent. So if that money went to the gymnasium or the football field or computers in uh, the math lab or something like that that was not agreed upon that money was not reimbursed. But if it could be shown that it was spent according to the agreement, then that money was reimbursed. So it really kept, helped keep everybody honest, I guess, and helped the money go where it was intended to go. So again, I think that's a crucial part of the success of vocational education. It's something for you to remember that is really different from education generally nationwide or even worldwide. It was an innovation, a true innovation, many of these things. Does anyone have any comments or questions then at this point before I move along? Okay. That was about 1914. This led directly to the Smith-Hughes Act in 1917. The Smith-Hughes Act is the first great act of Congress that established vocational and funded vocational education in America. You can say that our 
system of vocational education in America started right here in 1917. What happened to that three years between 1914 when the commission made its recommendation to Congress in 1917? What happened? Think about it a little bit. Something really revolutionary is happening in education, isn't it? And some of the control is being taken from those people who have traditionally held it, right? There's money at stake, lots of money. So, as you might well expect, there was a lot of squabbling going on. There was a lot of fighting, a lot of lobbying going on in Congress. And they couldn't make up their mind. Nothing could actually happen until in 1917, President Woodrow Wilson made an urgent plea to Congress to pass the bill. Think again, what was happening about 1917? Anybody want to venture a guess? Try your audio, see if I can hear you. What was happening in about 1917 that might have precipitated this uh, plea from President Wilson to the Congress to go ahead and fund and establish vocational education? Industrial Revolution. Oh yeah, that too. And it all happened. He's kind of time. thinking about it and talking about it. What? World War One. World War One. Absolutely. Uh, World War One. <laughs> and what would happen as a as a result of a world war that you might need vocational education? And industry had to kick into high gear, didn't it? If we were to uh, really prepare the war machine to be victorious in a world war, you know, our industry really had to get into high gear, which meant we really had to have a lot of training, a lot of non-traditional training. Right? What happens when most of the young men go into the service and go into the Army, go into the Air Force, the Navy, whatever? That leaves a lot of the non-traditional younger people, women, older people, non-essential kinds of industries and businesses that retrain or cross-train into those kinds of things that are essential for the war machine right so vocational education at that point got a really big boost i mean it got a major kickoff immediately by world war one okay exactly and so at the urging of the president and at the eminence of world war one uh, the Smith-Hughes Act was passed without a dissenting vote. They passed the bill pretty much straight along the lines of the recommendations from the commission. All right, let's look at some beginnings in Oklahoma. Oklahoma had vocational training in Indian schools when we were still Indian Territory, before statehood, when many of the tribes back east were moved into Oklahoma Territory, some of the priests and missionaries came along with them, or shortly thereafter, and established Indian schools. Some of these schools are still standing today some of these schools are still in use. I think one or two schools would be maybe all male, 
are all female. Some of them were both. Some of them had huge dormitories, and all of the students lived there at the school. Some of them were kind of in a community, and the students traveled to the school. So you found all sorts of different kinds of things, but there was a lot of vocational training going on in Oklahoma. Part of the reason was that when you uproot a society, you uproot a community and you take it somewhere else, there may not be the physical surroundings to support the society like it was used to. They could not hunt. Maybe they could not farm like they were used to. Maybe there was not room or whatever for, for them to run cattle like they were used to. The society had to change. So that was part of education to help educate those individuals to change as the change was necessary. Manual training then kind of came into place in 1904. In Oklahoma City, you find the first manual training. So that manual training school that uh, I was familiar with is 50 years old. That's about how long the manual training schools lasted in Oklahoma. That school kind of had a, a little rocky start. They had one instructor and one school supervisor, and that instructor wasn't too hot. So they fired him and got a different one the next year, and that instructor worked for 40 years in that system and helped strongly establish the manual training schools. And very shortly thereafter, the uh, fact is, within three years, by the time statehood came around, there were three strong, three more strong centers for, uh, for manual training in Oklahoma. That's Lawton, Comanche, and Ardmore. Okay. An evolution came along, as all things do. They grow, they change, and the name changed as well. In 1904, Manual Training Magazine ran an article uh, by Charles Richards that suggested changing the name from manual training to industrial arts. Well, that really didn't happen much uh, for 20 years. And then some of the high schools that were manual training high schools still remained manual training, clear, like I said, clear up into the latter 60s not, and maybe early 70s. But the programs in the secondary high schools, were, they changed from being designated as manual training programs to industrial arts. And that happened in the mid-20s. In the 70s and 80s, the popularity of the area of Botex really came on strong. And so industrial arts, again changed and became technology education. So you find in our Votech system uh, a lot of different service areas, and we'll talk about this shortly. But technology education then changed from industrial arts and remained still an entity of its own. All right, let's ask a question here, Oklahoma-wise. <clears throat> what is education? We talked about what vocational education is. We talked about philosophy of education. We talked about apprenticeships. We talked about all a lot of different ways historically that education was done, haven't we? But let's talk about a really up-to-date kind of modern definition of education. All right, first of all, education is a process by which 
we prepare for life. All right? I want to emphasize this word process. Because education is not something that you just go do for a year or two years and you're done with it. Education is also not the thing that you are learning. Education is not, hear me, education is not the information that you learn. Education is the process by which you learn it. It kind of goes back to the old uh, saying that if you teach, if you give a man a uh, fish, you feed him for today. If you teach him how to fish, he can feed himself for a lifetime. Okay? That's the difference between, you know, just a little bit of knowledge or a training and actual education. It's a lifelong kind of thing. We'll talk about that later in the course as well at some length about lifelong learning. Okay? It's a planned set of learning experiences. Education is not somebody just wandering through life and bumping into things, and as they bump into these things, they gain experience and they kind of learn by a haphazard collection of, of experiences. All right? It's a planned learning experience. It requir requires formal attendance, usually at a school, at a place. It requires your time in a planned and formal way. It is also preparation for a role in society. Education, again, is much more than the skill or the technology, the knowledge that you learn is preparing you for a role in society. Let that sink in for just a minute. America is a somewhat unique kind of place in that we are called the melting pot of the world, are we not? Think about all the different nationalities, all the different societies, all the different cultures that come into our nation, and how are they assimilated how are they trained? How are they uh, prepared to live in our society? How are they socialized? Through our educational system, aren't they? That educational system takes everyone, natural born or uh, imports, <laughs> and prepares them for for their role in our society. Okay, education then and educators have developed a list of what is called the seven cardinal aims of education. This is something for you to remember. You will see them again much in the way that you will see philosophy, mission statements, and that sort of thing. These are guiding aims of education that still apply. And yeah, they're relatively old. They came from the turn of the century. Long about the time vocational education was really getting kicked off, all right? About the time Oklahoma was getting a good kick off. The first cardinal aim of education is health. Now, uh, let me see if I can find it. It's in the book somewhere. Yes, I did. Just have the time over there, don't it? Yeah. <laughs> Page 
page 75. Yeah, about page 75. Okay. If you kind of follow along there a little bit, it gives you a little bit of an explanation. First one is health. Second one is the command of fundamental process. These fundamentals are like the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. Okay. Worthy home membership. Now, how did that get thrown in there? What do the schools have to do about home membership? <laughs> it involves training in obedience, reverence, courtesy, respect for elders, cooperation. Woo! Does it seem like a lot of education or educators are kind of getting away from maybe this number three. Think about the breakdown in the home. Think about how there is a very, uh, to a great degree, there's a lot less of that courtesy and reverence and respect for elders among our youth today than there were 20 years ago. 30, 40 years ago when I was going to public school. Okay. Also, vocation. <laughs> Misspell that one, too. My spell check needs some help, doesn't it? Means I need to use it. <laughs> this objective necessitates such facilities as will permit instruction of vocational nature. They saw the importance of a person having training for some sort of job. Citizenship, another biggie. Worthy use of leisure. How many of our youth do you know have nothing better to do than just make trouble, get in trouble, they have nothing to do. I can't tell you how many times I've heard kids say, well, I'm bored. I don't have anything to do. And all they do is go out cruising. And when they get bored, got nothing to do, they get into mischief. They do not have much training in the use of their leisure time, do they? They don't know how to entertain themselves. They have grown up being entertained by the TV or whatever, and they expect to be entertained. They cannot make their own worthy use of leisure. And the last one, ethical character. That's a really big thing, too. To develop an ethical character among our youth. If you look on page 76 and 77, you'll find also uh, some other lists. As the seven cardinal aims were established toward the turn of the century, find in 1933 that that list was expanded upon a little bit and called the imperative educational needs of youth. This was developed by the commission of the National Educational Association so that educators and legislators alike would have guidelines again for education. They have to do, uh, if you look at them again, you can see the influence of the seven cardinal aims, but they're expanded upon somewhat. There are some additional statements. 1984, the goals and objectives for education were uh, actually 
published by the Association for Supervision and Curriculum and Development in a publication known as What We Know About Teaching. The imperative educational needs of youth, you see, there's 10 of them, expanded from seven cardinal aims, and now we have 12 objectives of education. Again, if you look at those and match them up with the seven cardinal aims, you'll see most of those are still there and some additional ones. There's wise use of leisure. That's on the top of this list. A knowledge of world problems. Again, that, that's a new one. Skill in the use of the three R's. That's in the seven cardinal aims. Improve self-concept. That's a new one. Sense of patriotism. Preparation for college. A desire for learning. Respect for others. Multicultural understandings. Spiritual and moral values. Okay? Ethical character. So there were several things that were added. If you get to compare these three lists, look for those seven original aims, and you'll see that they are there, and maybe change a little bit and add them, add it to. Okay. Most of you, I think, have probably heard education called training at one time or another, right? We talked about manual training schools a while ago. We, if you look at the readings and a lot of the early literature, it talks about industrial training. But as legislation developed and as uh, the national societies and the commissions on vocational education really did their work and refined the goals and refined the uh, definitions of vocational education, they settled on some things. And one of them was that it is education that we are about, not training. Some of the differences are that education is long term. We're back to that process, a continuing process. Education is not is multifaceted. It's not narrow in scope. That is, education encompasses math, English, history, geography, science, all sorts of things. Okay, to make you a more well-rounded individual. And then, if you look more specifically at training you will see that much of the human resource development writers generally agree that training is defined as limited time, job specific, and technically oriented. That is, it's related specifically to a job. Okay? Again, it's shorter term, It's specific to a job that you are generally already trained for or already educated for or already doing, but you're training for a new aspect, an upgrade or something. So it's very job specific and generally technical in orientation. Although sometimes training can be in stress, Relieving in uh, communications, um, how to manage anger, okay? Could be a lot of things that way, but generally those are direct support of the job. 
Okay. Mentioned a little while ago that vocational education then, uh, as was being recommended to the national legislature and Congress, it was recommended what vocational education should do, what it should encompass, what the service areas should be. The first one is agriculture. Second one is home economics. The third, trade and industrial. Fourth, it used to be distributive education. More recently, it's been changed to marketing ed. Practical nursing, and it used to be called practical nursing training. Still does sometimes, uh, still is referred to that sometimes. Generally speaking, practical nursing is like a one-year program that is very specific in nature, limited time. So I guess it could be called training, but practical nursing education technical and technical education. Those are the vocational education service areas. If you look at the area Votech schools, if you look at what the Oklahoma Department of Vocational Technical Education, what they supervise, it's these areas. Okay. Some of them, like technical education, or marketing, you may find in and home economics, you may find almost exclusively in the comprehensive high school. Agriculture, FFA, VOLAG, you might find almost exclusively in the comprehensive high school setting. But trade and industrial education, nursing, some of the home economics kinds of things you will find in the area of Votech schools, even the community colleges, junior colleges, and some universities. We talked about that before already uh, in this course, about how there are articulation agreements and how that you can move through a high school vocational plan and move right on through college, right on through university, four-year degree, and some graduate studies. So a vocational degree is not necessarily limiting as far as education goes. Used to be um, a lot of the perception was that if you took Votech, you were not headed to college. And the classes that went along with it did not prepare you for college and were not accepted by the colleges. That is not necessarily true today. And one final area is business and office education. And this you will find uh, in both comprehensive high schools and Votech. It's probably one of the biggest areas. Okay. There is some final provisions of the legislation. One that you really should be interested in, and that's teacher education. Not only was the funding put in place, not only was the funding put in place, for the tools and equipment and facilities and curriculum and much of the funding procedures and all of that sort of thing established for vocational education, but also the funding and procedures were established for teacher education. Why? Were not universities already turning out teachers? Were there not already universities in place that had teacher education programs? Why would it be necessary? 
why would it be necessary to include provisions for teacher education in a vocational legislation bill? This is why. The principle that was operating here was that teachers were to be made from tradesmen. Remember when we talked about that a, a few minutes ago? Teachers were to be made from tradesmen and not teachers trained to be tradesmen. We find that most evident today in what area? Trade and industrial, right? Trade and industrial education is really the uh, clearest example of taking tradesmen out of industry and putting them into the classroom. And you are now taking coursework to help you become effective teachers. But you were tradespersons first technically skilled in the industry first, not the other way around. Although there is a movement, a pretty strong movement in some sectors, for vocational education teachers to first of all be trained as a teacher and then given the technical skills to learn the technical skills that they need to teach whatever trade. Can you see problems maybe on both sides? Can you see advantages maybe to both arguments? Probably if you think about it for a little, you can. Think of pros and cons on both sides. But I think, personally, after having viewed um, the vocational system in Oklahoma and how it works and how it worked for me, I took teacher training at, on the bachelor's level and then went into industry because I, I was trained in history found out when I went to look for a job that if you were not a coach, you couldn't teach history in Oklahoma. Well, I was not a coach, thank you very much. Besides which, I was sick of school when I graduated from college the first time. I'd worked about three jobs for two and a half years and was married and trying to go to school full time and graduate. I was sick of school. So I went into industry for a while. But I always wanted to be a teacher. I always felt it drawing me. I always liked it. And so my outlet for most of those years was teaching in my church. I taught, I was a music director, I taught the choir. I taught uh, Royal Masters in the Southern Baptist, which is kind of like Boy Scouts. I taught Sunday school class. I was a lifeguard and I taught swimming lessons. So I was always involved with it. I needed that outlet, I guess. It was really important to me. So I can see the value of becoming a, trip, a, a really skilled tradesman and then being taught a skill of being a teacher. Are there questions or anything at this point? Comments that you would like to make about what we've discussed so far? Well, I would say it's break time. Let's take about uh, 15 minutes at this point. My watch says 20 till. Let's come back about 5 till. And we'll continue to see it. Okay? There's no questions or comments. Don't
try to contact me during break, I'm going to be out of here too. Alright? till nine. Can share with others. Turn to page 83, and you will see there are eight different information sheets in this section, or at least uh, different parts. First discusses our public image public school instructional personnel, statements from administration of vocational education, state and federal relationships, teacher training, trade and industrial education, growth of the American high school and theorems, Prosser's theorems of vocational education. We're going to go through this chapter fairly quickly. Um, because we're going to come back to it. Um, and look at a lot of these things in a lot more depth on really the second half of the course. So as far as instructional, our public image, uh, instructional personnel, uh, teacher training, training industrial education, a lot of those kinds of things we're going to come back and look at in a lot greater depth and detail. So all I really want to do this evening is just kind of introduce it. And uh, then we're going to talk about some assignments and we're going to talk about uh, what we're going to do next week. And that will be all for this evening. So I think if I can keep things rolling here, you'll be out again well before 10 o'clock. Okay, on page 84, it talks about our public image. And as we have already alluded to this evening, with the manual training high schools, um, a lot of these training schools were nothing more than dumping grounds for uh, incorrigibles or delinquents, if you will, uh, students that were really bad students. Um, they were really kind of the lower end of the student crop, okay? So from that aspect, manual training really kind of had a bad image. And vocational training by association, and at least it's associated in the public's mind quite a bit, really gave us a bad image. I know most of you in one form or another, either yourself uh, didn't Maybe you did not go to Votex when you were in high school, and you know a lot of that negative kind of image that was out there because you may have shared some of that negative image with the public yourself. And now as you're being introduced to Votex, you're becoming a part of it, you really see that it's not what the public perception is. All right, so part of our job there is really changing our image in the public eye, is it not? That's an important part of the vocational educator. Okay? Another reason that vocational education maybe had a poor public image was because of the industrial arts program in high schools. Remember me talking earlier this evening about my industrial arts experience where I made broom holders and uh, boot jacks and stuff like that? <laughs> okay. Not real impressive as far as preparing anybody for any kind of wage earning or job or helping industry or helping society out, right? certainly doesn't uh, get the public excited about major expenditures for tools and equipment and really nice facilities so students can go out and make 
uh, stuff out of broomsticks or to hold, you know, racks in the broom closet or a little step stool for mom for the kitchen or something like that, right? Bad image. If you ask a lot of the public today, we're talking people that are mid-40s, most parents that have kids that are now coming up to high school age, their experience of vocational education is such that they really have a negative view. Okay? So a major portion of the educator and the vocational education system is one of public relations. Our image is really a large part of what we have to deal with. It's a major reason that we get a lot of the students we get because counselors and parents and administrators in the public think that, oh well, send them to Votech. They're not very good students. They don't learn very well. They don't have any abilities or they're really causing a lot of troubles at the high school. Well, that's what Votech's for. We're still battling that today to a really large extent. So we will find that a lot of the jobs that we have as vocational educators directly relates to our image, the image that the public holds of vocational education. I really think that a lot of that is changing, but it's really changing slowly. And it will not be until our students of the last few years and right now come up where they are sending their children to school, they are in a position where they're making political policy and they are running businesses and demanding and looking for the graduates from the vocational institutions that we're going to find a really, really marked change unless those intervening years we as public uh, vocational educators can really make uh, some strides in changing our public image. Okay. We can even find that the initial vocational education during the 70s and even much of the 80s has really changed drastically today. I can remember the vocational schools and being involved with them in the early 80s, in the latter 70s, taking some classes myself as an adult. I learned to weld. First of all, that's the first thing I did. I learned how to rebuild automatic transmissions. I did some cabinet building. Several things. And so I can see having a, had a long association with vocational education where we have really changed a lot. There is not as much demand for trade and industrial. But what came along in that era? The personal computer came along in the early 80s, didn't it? And you can see how it has changed the face of business and vocational education. Business and office classes and education in the Votex has just mushroomed. It's exploded with all the different computer uh, kinds of applications that there are out there and the, the fast pace at which software and hardware is evolving. It's taking a lot of training, both for our high school students, traditional Botex students, and for the adults. We have branched out a lot. Not only do we have just uh, the regular classes like we, we talked about before, but healthcare not just practical nursing, but also there's radiologic technology. There's physical therapy assistance. There's all sorts of gerontology and administration in healthcare. Business and office has a lot of applications in the healthcare industry. So 
that's one of the largest industries that's growing. Vocational education is part of that. So we see really that we are changing a lot. But as much as that really, the high tech sort of stuff, like computers and whatever, and the healthcare industry, the vocational education is, is really working in and has a good reputation in with the public, you still see a lot of the traditional trade industrial, like carpentry, and construction, automotive technologies, whether it be auto body or, or auto service technologies, diesel, those kinds of things, still have kind of suffer a little bit from negative public image. It's this thing with working with your hands and using tools and getting dirty, it still kind of carries a negative connotation even though most people be, will be quick to say that, man, I cannot believe how much it cost me to have my car worked on or to have some plumbing done at my house or to have some remodel work done by a carpenter. They sure make a lot of money. But the way they make it, they still have some negative connotations and so we are still fighting this image problem. Okay. Shift gears a little bit on page 86 and talk about vocational education teachers. Um, you have a lot of responsibilities besides teaching. <coughs> I alluded to this when we were talking about the seven cardinal aims of education, remember, and I said, think about those, remember those, we'll come back to them. We're gonna come back to them right here. Part of it has to do with a lot of the responsibilities we have as a vocational teacher. Most of you have your students half a day. That's more than any teacher in the high school does, that's probably as much or more than the coach does if they're on a some kind of ball team or something. That's more time than the parents spend with them. That's as much or more time than they spend with their friends. So you are one of the single most important influences in their life. So if you look back at those seven cardinal lanes, when it talks about ethical character, talks about wise use of leisure time. Those are things that have to be built into your program as a vocational educator if your program is going to be successful, if it's going to meet the needs of your students. Okay? Some of the ways that you do that are, uh, you go to the second paragraph. Additional duties shall include the organization of instructional courses, development of course content, all those kinds of things that you normally associate with teachers, curriculum, the skills, and that sort of thing. But you'll also maintain close contact with guidance personnel. It's this image thing again. How to direct students into course coursework that's going that they're going to be uh, more likely to be successful in or that they will like and hopefully go into that line of work when they graduate. Okay? Teachers or teacher coordinators shall cooperate with guidance personnel and selecting students, all right? How many of you are really involved in that process? Or how many of you just get your roster when you come to school in August and say, well, here's my students. I wonder where they came from. I wonder what they're like. I wonder who they are. I wonder what kind of kids I'm going to have this year. 
Of course, Willie, you don't have a whole lot of choice. No. Some of the students you get. How many of you are really involved in that? Okay. Maybe it's going to take a little proactive uh, involvement on your part. Then down toward the bottom of the page are the vocational student organization. You're going to find a lot of the leadership things, the ethical considerations, the building of character, leadership, communications, community involvement, and community service. Those kinds of things you'll find through the vocational student organization, and we're going to spend uh, at least one whole night on vocational student organizations, and maybe two this semester. But you should be familiar with all the vocational student organizations that you as vocational teachers or vocational education in general uh, that are they're involved with. Agriculture, FFA, Business and Office, FBLA, Marketing is DECA, uh, Home Economics would be FHA and HERO, Trade and Industrial, VICA, of course, Health Occupations would be HOSA, and Technology Education, TSA. That's one really large area, and I think you'll find by the time we get to discussing that, and some of you that have had my uh, vocational student organizations class already know that the vocational student organization is your main way of managing and organizing your classroom. It helps uh, in discipline, it helps in classroom control, it helps in all sorts of ways. Just the minute kinds of administration stuff, like taking roll and cleaning up the shop and putting up the tools, they really, a successfully run class really depends on how well you have organized your vocational student organization. That's on the one side. That's kind of on your side, okay? On the other side, the student side, it is the main way that they learn leadership, that they learn a lot of the responsibility that goes with being a good employee. It's the way they learn communication. It's the way they learn how to, uh, to live and work with other people how to operate in teams, okay? A lot of those management skills <coughs> that may be just mundane, but somebody has to do it. And every one of you have been in work situations where those mundane little things about just how stuff gets filed and how employees get notified of important things that are going on in the organization, how reports are filed, how you turn in your timesheets and if you get paid, you know, all those mundane, ordinary things. You can really tell those organizations in which those ordinary things are done well and the ones that they're done really poorly. And it makes a really big difference to the employees and morale and the efficiency of the whole organization. Your students, they learn that through the vocational student organization. They should be learning that in your program. If you're doing cleanup, if you're doing all the or organization of the cleanup, if you're taking the role, if you're making sure all the tools are put up and inventory, and if you're making sure all the materials that they work with, the consumables, are inventoried and the orders are put together, you're doing all that kind of stuff yourself, you know, you're doing way too much. First of all, you don't have the time for it, and it make you a grumpy old person 
after a while when you're overworked like that. And second of all, you're depriving your students of the experience. After all, they are the ones that are there for the experience and the learning, not you. If you already know how to do it, it's time you let them learn how to do it. If it's an important part of your job, then someday it's going to be an important part of their job and they need to have the experience. Okay. I want to look a little bit at uh, administrative relationships, uh, not, not just under the Federal Vocational Education Act. You guys can read this on page 87 and 88 and, and 89. Um, I'm not going to sit here and read the book to you, okay? You can do that for yourself. But I have some comments that I would like to make, a little discussion relative to some of those things that may add to it. Talked about, the, again, the purpose of vocational education, and we've talked about that, how to serve students who can profit by it, who need it, and uh, the purpose also is to help, of course, uh, for the maintaining of our, our way of life and our society. But also contributes toward, like I said before, talking about good citizens, it contributes to their health. It contributes to their social, civic, cultural, and economic interests. All right? It's not just the skill. If you really haven't gotten the picture yet, the skill you teach your students, the technical skills you teach, really should not be the major portion of what your students learn. Think about again what I said earlier in tonight's session about industry really being willing to teach a lot of the job specific skills that's why HRD departments are really growing and there's a lot of industry training going on. We also know that technology is changing so rapidly that we cannot hope to stay on the leading edge. We cannot hope <clears throat> to teach them things that are current that are going to really be what they use when they go to industry. It may for a little while but it's changing so quickly that sometimes the things that our students learn by the time they get out and go to work, they're already obsolete, right? So we really kind of fight a losing battle in that regard. What we can do is give them some things that are our real basis for successful employment. And that's all those things. And a successful life goes back to Aristotle and says, we should live happily and beautifully. Okay, the roots are even go back to that far, ancient Greece. But it contributes to good citizenship, good health, good social, civic, and cultural and economic interests of the individual. Okay. So all of this was built into the legislation from the national level as it floated down to your level. I also mentioned that much of the relationship of vocational education to um, national interest had to do with a funds matching kind of situation. That the federal government gives funding and then the state and local governments match that funding. That still means that on, in vocational education, we still have a very, very strong local control. What does that mean? That means that in your program, 